Good afternoon. I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you community for being here with us for this live stream today. Thank you press for coming and uh, hearing the stories that will be shared with you today. I want to begin first by acknowledging we are on indigenous ancestral lands in a country built by stolen black lives. Specifically, I want to acknowledge that I am here on Duwamish land in the Coastal Salish territories. We are here to discuss why people serving longer sentences, especially black and brown people, are living at the mercy of the Department of Corrections during this COVID-19 pandemic, and how we can amplify and support their voices through journalism and storytelling. Today's press conference includes important insights from family members advocating for their loved ones. We will have a question and answer with select questions that you can share directly in the chat to me. My name is Nikita Oliver. I'm a local artist, organizer, activist, and lawyer, and I will be moderating for today. Our day is going to begin and end with a call to action on addressing the crisis in DOC facilities as incarcerated loved ones battle for their dignity and one of the places where it is hardest to receive care and compassion. The heart of the stories we will share today are about human dignity and challenging the notion that prison sentences must form or be a form of social death. By law, the Department of Corrections is required to ensure the safety of people in its care. COVID makes this matter much more urgent. Mercy and compassion must be a critical part of how we create safety in society. With that in mind, Purveyors of justice cannot have blood on their hands. And I just want to remind you again, the question and answer will be at the end. Please send those questions directly to me when that time comes. My name is Nikita Oliver. Dean, my, name, my understanding is that your wife, Cynthia Sue Miller, who is age 60, is in Washington Corrections Center for Women. And there's a, a lovely photo of you and your wife. Can you give us a sense of why her situation has taken such a drastically bad turn and what your fears are for your wife's life? Uh, Dean, I'm not sure you're unmuted yet. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you okay. now. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, in uh, 2005, my, my wife uh, received a uh, medical procedure um, where she was, uh, she had an implant uh, for a uh, prolapsed bladder. And uh, immediately after that uh, surgical procedure, um, she began having uh, complications. And those complications over the course of 10 years um, compounded uh, themselves and with her existing medical conditions um, put her at a very delicate, very serious uh, uh, situation. In uh, uh, 2016, um, she was incarcerated. Her, she lost her case and, uh, and she began serving her time at uh, WCCW. Due to uh, um, Due to her conditions being so intertwined and complex with one another, um, it was very difficult having, you know, getting her medical treatment on the outside. And uh, when, uh, when she became incarcerated at WCCW, yeah, immediately, her very first day, uh, she began having uh, troubles with medical records getting transferred, proper treatment, proper medications. Some of the medications that she was on, she was not allowed to have in DOC. And, um, and the, the overall treatment, treatment with her started to decline almost instantly. Um, she had had a reconstructive surgery um, in 2015, just prior to her trial, and uh, didn't recover well. Um, and she was still in the process of trying to recover when she did go to trial. Uh, so that being said, she, um, uh, she began having a lot of troubles at the DOC. 
um, and get, getting treated. As a matter of fact, uh, I was told by them that they did not have medical staff trained and qualified to be able to treat for complex uh, medical conditions. Um, um, over the course of the, the four years that she's been incarcerated at, uh, at DOC, um, her condition has worsened. Um, her kidneys have now failed. Uh, she has stage three kidney failure. Um, her colon is collapsed. Um, the bladder, or her bladder has prolapsed forward the mesh device um, and has dropped down. Um, and uh, she also is, is suffering from a shattered shoulder uh, where she was transported from WCCW to uh, Yakima Department of Corrections. And uh, while en route, uh, she went unconscious in the uh, transport vehicle, fell to the floor and shattered her shoulder. As of today's date, she has only been examined by a doctor to validate the fact that her shoulder is blown out and that she's in need of a total shoulder replacement. So that being said, she has been going around inside the facility with a shattered shoulder for over 10 months. She can't be given any pain medications because the pain medications affect the kidneys. And so she's basically uh, suffering by the, only the use of ibuprofen. We have, uh, we have filed over the last two years, uh, two emergency medical furloughs. We filed uh, several emergency medical placements, all of which uh, we haven't gotten an answer back or the EMPs have been denied. Um, we've also filed a writ of mandamus um, in, in, in hopes that we could get her released uh, so that we can get her to a doctor that can treat her. I had a complete medical protocol set up for her, a um, surgeon um, through Swedish medical facility that specialized in reconstructive surgery of a lower pelvic wall. And uh, everything was set up. And because DOC just failed to follow through with what I had, I had set up through the liaison, we no longer have that doctor. We no longer have the facility. And we have to start all over again. Um, also, um, their lack of uh, uh, trying to help the situation, trying to get her treated, has also affected her, her, uh, her uh, settlement. Um, because she hasn't had the corrective surgery to, to uh, um, either remove the organs that are affected and or try to remove the, the mesh itself, um, until she has that surgery, she's only being awarded a certain amount of money. Um, and that's basically nothing. It's just nothing. It's really not nothing at all. Um, and so- Dean, do you mind if I ask uh, specifically, can you speak to what your fears are right now in the midst of COVID uh, as it relates to your wife's condition and the symptoms that she's been experiencing? I'm afraid that if something is not done, done quickly, if she's not seen by a specialist, I'm afraid that she's not going to make it. I, I don't think she, she's, her body is undergoing too much stress. She's got internal organ failure. And I don't, I don't see how Department of Corrections cannot take that serious. Um, it, 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 I'm just beside myself. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't emphasize the fear that we have. I'm afraid I'm going to lose her. Um, and she's hanging on. She has hope, but she's hanging on that she can get out and get to a doctor that'll treat her. Thank you, Dean. Uh, appreciate you. you sharing. Uh, and just want to take a moment to hold space for your heart and the experience that you just shared with all of us. There are lots of families that are experiencing this. Uh, Chandra, you are the sister of a man named Harold Donald, who's been held in solitary for nearly 60 days. We are concerned about the possibility of retaliation in discussing this matter. So please keep that in mind. Uh, but the issue is so important that Harold authorized you to speak out on his behalf, even in fear of retaliation. Chandra, can you give us a sense of what things were like the day you got the update on Harold? After that, let's check in with attorneys Danny Waxwing from Disability Rights Washington. 
And later in question and answer, when we are discussing Harold's situation, Chandra may join uh, the attorneys, uh, the attorney be joined by attorney Chris Carney. Uh, Chandra, thank you so much for being here with us today. You're still muted, Chandra. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. My name is Chandra and my brother's name is Harold. We have two different mothers and because of that and other reasons beyond our control, we weren't able to meet until he was 13 and I was 23. When we did, however, we spent lots of time together and became incredibly close. He was in foster care and group homes and he loved to stay at my house on the weekends or even longer in the summertime. We would stay up late watching movies. He loved to cook with me and we loved listening to music. We both like uh, R&B. My son also fondly remembers his uncle Harold as the one that taught him how to do a, a handstand and he would do, they would do cartwheels together in the backyard. Harold has been incarcerated for almost 10 years. During that time, we haven't been able to be in each other's lives in the same way, but we've kept in touch with letters, messages, and by phone. We talk on the phone at least three to four hours um, a week. Usually he'll call me every other day and we'll talk for about an hour. On Sunday, June 23rd, I received a Facebook message from the wife of an inmate at Stafford Creek Correctional Center letting me know that my brother had been badly beaten by corrections officers while handcuffed. I was at first very confused and thought maybe it was a joke because, you know, it's Facebook and I didn't know this person. Um, so I called Stafford Creek Correction Center and was even more confused to find out that he wasn't there. I had just spoken to him a couple days earlier and I knew that if he was going to transfer to another facility, he would have let me know. So I knew this was not something that was planned. Um, I asked Stafford Creek where he was and they would not tell me. So at this point, I was so afraid that maybe he was in an outside hospital or something, you know, he was really, really badly injured. I called, um, I asked the lady that messaged me on Facebook for her phone number and she said she gave it to me and I called her right away. And I was told by her that at 3 a.m. that morning, my brother woke up and went to use the restroom, which is located outside of his cell. Um, he had forgotten to put his face mask on, and when returning to his cell, he was stopped by a corrections officer and asked why he wasn't wearing his face mask. Um, he was heard saying something along the lines of, oh, sorry, I forgot, I'm going right back to my cell. And he did as promised and went right back to his cell, got back, at bed and got back in bed and went back to sleep. About 45 minutes later, I'm told he was awoken from his sleep by three corrections officers standing outside of his cell door um, and asked to come with them. Um, from them, from that there, I was told he was handcuffed, pepper sprayed, tackled down to the ground, and then beaten. I am told that the officer punching him was yelling racial slurs as well. This all happened because he had forgotten to put his face mask on in the middle of the night. I was told that two out of the three corrections officers that were involved in the beating also were not wearing masks, which I find very ironic. From Stafford Creek Correctional Center, following his beating, he was taken to the medical unit. I'm so sorry about my dogs. The medical unit at Stafford Creek where he was given stitches and then transferred to an outside facility, facility for an MRI. From there, he was taken to um, Washington Correctional Center in Shelton and um, immediately put in the IMU or otherwise known as solitary confinement or the hole. He remains there today. That means he's only allowed to leave his cell for an hour a day to either shower or take phone calls. In the other 24, 23 hours a day, he is confined to a small cell. That means for 58 days straight, my bro brother has been in solitary. DOC did not reach out to my family members regarding his transfer or to inform any of us that he was even injured. His mental health is rapidly declining and I'm terrified for not only his mental, but his physical well-being. My brother has bipolar one disorder as well as PTSD. In researching solitary confinement since my brother has been at Washington Correction Center, I have learned that solitary confinement is harmful to everybody, everyone, but especially people with disabilities such as my brother. 
I've also learned that solitary confinement is used in lieu of providing adequate mental health services or when adequate staffing levels for mental health services are unavailable. Since being at Washington Correction Center, my brother's mental health has been in severe decline. He's afraid of the food. He's afraid of the water. He thinks he's being poisoned by the corrections officers. Last week, he didn't eat or drink water for four days straight. At that time, he was placed in the infirmary and would only eat when a staff member took a bite of his meal first to prove that it didn't have poison in it. He doesn't trust DOC staff and he really does not feel safe. He's still unable to see out of his left eye after two months after the attack, and he hasn't seen an eye specialist. He still experiences frequent dizziness, headaches, and at times has trouble finding words. He has been seen by mental health only one time in the two months since he's been in solitary confinement. And all they did was ask him if he wanted an evaluation, which he said yes, and that evaluation still has not happened. My biggest fear is retaliation against my brother by corrections officers. I have voiced that concern to him, but he wants me to continue to fight for justice for him. My hope is that Harold is immediately taken out of solitary confinement and that his mental health is treated. My hope is that upon Harold's release, he can be transferred to Twin Rivers where he would be able to be part of the dog program again. The WAG dog training program is a program that rescues dogs and takes them to prisons where they are trained and then adopted out into families in Washington State. My brother participated, has participated in this program in the past and absolutely loved it. Those dogs taught my brother how to be responsible, how to show up no matter how difficult the task is. It taught him true loyalty and I think most of all, those dogs taught my brother unconditional love. I also hope that any and all pending infractions due to the incident that occurred are dropped against my brother. I hope that all three of the officers involved in my brother's attack are held accountable for their actions. I understand how important it is to wear masks during this crazy pandemic, but I also think that the egregious way that those three officers reacted in response to my brother forgetting to mask up in the middle of the night is appalling. My brother Harold is a human being just like you and me, and he should be treated as such. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra, for sharing such a vulnerable story with us and sharing Harold's words and reminding us how important it is to honor and treat everyone with their human dignity. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce Danny from Disability Rights Washington, but before I do, I wanna share that Harold was in a restorative program where he trained dogs. Uh, and we heard some lovely dog barking in the background. Just a reminder to us that Harold is here with us in this moment. Um, and as DOC looks at cuts to enrichment programs budgets, like that we really want to emphasize uh, based on what we've heard from Harold that this one should be retained because they make a difference. And so uh, Danny, Waxwing from Disability Rights Washington. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, do you mind adding to the things that Chandra has already shared with us? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanna say thanks first to Dean and Chandra for sharing with us about your loved ones' experiences and your commitment to them and really insisting on their dignity and humanity is, is so important and I, I really value that. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with Harold's story. DOC released a statement about the incident that Chandra described. And what stood out to me when I read DOC's statement is that they appear to have taken for granted that a show of force, you know, calling for backup with this plan to restrain Harold, that that was appropriate and necessary in the first place. And I think that we should all be questioning that. Um, I don't pretend to know all of the complexities of what happened that night, but what I know is that what Chandra shared touches on a number of systemic issues that people inside and their loved ones have long drawn attention to and fought to change, especially for black and brown people. Um, one of those issues that I, I just want to touch on briefly is the use of solitary confinement because it's so intertwined with how DOC maintains this intensely punitive environment and also their strategy for managing the pandemic behind bars. And this really puts black and brown folks in danger and especially anyone who is targeted by these intersecting oppressions like ableism, transphobia, homophobia. Um, Chandra 
talked a little bit about how Harold has basically gotten stuck in solitary confinement um, while DOC is conducting an investigation. And I want to be clear that it's really actually extremely common for people to report long stays and segregation during an investigation phase. This isn't exceptional. In fact, in the it's widely reported in the community that I work with, which is trans and non-binary prisoners with disabilities. Um, just earlier this year, someone I work with spent close to five months in solitary confinement while DOC investigated a complaint that ended up not being substantiated. And it is just so crucial, I think, that we not normalize these kinds of practices, no matter how consistently they might be occurring in DOC. Um, you know, solitary confinement is simply inhumane and it has devastating effects on people's physical and mental health. The United Nations says that solitary confinement should never be used for people with mental health disabilities and never for anyone for more than 15 days. It's considered a form of torture. And so I want us to really hold the gravity of that alongside what Chandra shared. Her brother has been in solitary confinement for nearly 60 days now and Harold has a mental health disability. Um, DOC's practices of isolating people under extremely restrictive conditions has also expanded during the COVID pandemic, and DOC has done this despite continually insisting that it is following guidance from medical experts. But the guidance from the CDC explains why distinguishing medical isolation from punitive solitary confinement is crucial, because if people experience punishment in response to being sick, it simply disincentivizes people to seek medical care and disclose any symptoms that they might be experiencing. And solitary confinement period makes people sicker. Folks that I work really closely with were placed in a quote unquote medical isolation unit at Twin Rivers unit back in March. And when I talked to them after they had been there for over a week, they were saying they still had zero time out of their cell in over a week, they had no shower, no access to warm or clean water to wash their hands. They were freezing cold because the building was not properly heated. And when I communicated with the superintendent, Eric Jackson, about those reports, he confirmed those conditions and then they implemented some small scale reforms. And I think, you know, some folks are going to think, well, that was towards the beginning of the pandemic when DOC was scrambling to figure things out and that's probably not what it's like anymore. But those complaints have remained the same during the recent outbreak at Coyote Ridge, which is on the other side of the state. And a nurse that was working for DOC recently reported appalling conditions along the same exact lines, even saying that there was a lack of access to restrooms such that people have had to defecate in coffee cans and urinate in water bottles. And the really the ongoing conditions in you know, medical isolation for people who are sick during this pandemic are more extreme than those of typical solitary confinement. And so it should really come as no surprise that when people who are high risk for COVID will not volunteer to self quarantine, because it just means getting stuck in the hole essentially. And one of my clients is a beloved elder in the community. She's a trans woman of color who's in her 60s. She has a number of chronic health conditions. So she's at extremely high risk for serious complications or death from COVID. And she received a notice from DOC that because she's at high risk, they wanted to quote unquote, offer her the opportunity to self quarantine. And they explained that this would be, you know, move to a different cell, not, she wouldn't be allowed out of her cell and it would be indefinite. And I'm not surprised that she declined to volunteer for indefinite solitary confinement. But, you know, right around that time, Governor Inslee got on a press conference and characterized people who are making these choices by saying, quote, we're hoping that when cooler heads prevail, they will avail themselves of this option to go into a safer situation. And we just hope people want to care for themselves. And I want the governor to understand that people like her who decline indefinite solitary confinement are doing so as an act of self-preservation. Um, I also just want to like really be clear that the brutal conditions that folks today are naming and drawing attention to are not new and they're not exceptional. And I think that that context is important because we have to understand that it's not sufficient to just address individual people's circumstances. All folks who are incarcerated are disproportionately vulnerable to COVID they can be up to 10 times as likely to be infected. They have health conditions associated with higher risks because they face racism, classism, ableism, and the effects of colonization. And then you layer on top of that, that incarceration itself is disabling. So what this translates to is that folks will die in DOC custody who otherwise would have lived if they were in the community. 
And in order to meaningfully address systemic racism and COVID-19 in our communities that are in and outside prison, we absolutely have to decarcerate on a massive scale. We need to rethink our systems for responding to harm. And public safety is not at, our, at odds with public health. Like we can be responsive to both at the same time. We have plenty of research that shows imprisoning our elders, imprisoning people for extremely long sentences, these distinctions between violent and nonviolent convictions, they don't actually correlate to creating a safer society. And it's really the governor who holds the power at this point to accomplish broad releases. And he can do that through commutations. Yet just this past week, his office told my colleagues that they are not even considering releasing more people as they did a few months ago. But in contrast, earlier this month, DOC released their budget reduction strategy in which they acknowledge that there must be a quote, significant and permanent reduction in the prison population. So whether people are gonna get released because DOC can no longer justify their incarceration based on cost, or whether we're gonna release them to tend to individual and public health needs, DOC itself is acknowledging that there are significant numbers of people who need to come home and that can come home in alignment with best practices for community safety and decreased recidivism. So that right now, the ball is in the governor's court. Thanks. Thank you, Danny, for really illuminating for us the, the environment and the conditions that everyone in DOC is facing, but especially those who have uh, additional extenuating circumstances as it relates to COVID. Uh, there, there are many that have been working on this issue and Nick Allen of Columbia Legal Services uh, has been doing a lot of work around the Department of Corrections. Nick, you helped bring an important challenge to the courts on behalf of our loved ones inside and their families. What do you think needs to be leveraged to get the governor and DOC to listen to the concerns of families mm -hmm. and incarcerated peoples around the dangers of COVID? And what are our next steps, uh, legal and otherwise? Yeah, thanks, Nikita. Um, when COVID first entered Washington State, um, families of prisoners, community members, legal advocates, uh, and others became very concerned about how it was going to impact people in DOC custody. Um, under normal circumstances, uh, as has been explained um, uh, so far, prisons are dangerous and unhealthy places to live. They're crowded and unsanitary, medical care is deficient, and raising concerns or speaking up about poor conditions can re result in punishment uh, and retaliation. And the prisons are located in isolated parts of the state, um, making it really easy to forget about people in these communities and their health and safety. The isolation and lack of outside access to these facilities also limits transparency and access to accurate and timely information about how DOC operates. As has also been explained earlier, due to mass incarceration, certain populations are, are more significantly impacted by these conditions. For decades, Washington has been over-incarcerating people of color, people living in poverty, people with disabilities, and then the pandemic hit, exposing these um, othered and forgotten populations to another layer of harm. As a result, concerned community members, including family members, community organizers and activists, and legal advocates quickly came together to identify all the ways that we could collaborate uh, to highlight and address this urgent problem, including legal advocacy. After reviewing the situation and learning more about DOCs and the governor's ineffective approach to COVID in the prisons, we believed um, legal action was warranted. Everything we know about prisons, um, their design, their high density, the significant number of medically vulnerable people, and the poor health care provided showed that it would be impossible for DOC to address a highly communicable disease like COVID without significantly reducing the population. All of the public health and correctional experts we consulted with confirmed that reduction was necessary to protect vulnerable people in prison from exposure to the, the, the uh, disease and to allow for appropriate levels of social distancing and hygiene within the prisons. So we filed a lawsuit against the governor and DOC secretary um, in which the petitioners asked the Washington Supreme Court to order the governor and DOC to identify people who were medically vulnerable or close to release and then assess and quickly return people from those categories back into the community. 
the petitioners and advocates warn that absent release, outbreaks would occur, subjecting people in prison and staff to a significant risk of harm, including death, uh, and create even more deplorable conditions within the prisons. Um, faced with this lawsuit, the DOC and the governor agreed to release people, unfortunately, uh, not enough to allow for true social distancing uh, behind our prison walls uh, and to offer the necessary protection of those who are vulnerable. Um, the court narrowly ruled against us uh, by a 5-4 decision. However, since the date of that decision in late April, we've seen play out what everyone warned would happen significant outbreaks and deteriorating conditions within the prisons. In the last few months, there's been a number of significant outbreaks at uh, various prisons across the state. Over 230 cases at Coyote Ridge, uh, including two deaths. Over 60 at the Monroe uh, Correctional Complex, uh, including the death of a staff member. And just in the last few weeks, 114 confirmed cases at the penitentiary in Walla Walla. Conditions have also worsened in the facilities where outbreaks have occurred. Uh, DOC's refusal to meaningfully reduce the prison population to contain the virus means that people at places like Coyote Ridge have been kept on nearly 24 hour cell confinement for weeks on end. People there have had limited access to showers and use of the restroom, resulting in residents soiling themselves or relieving themselves in bottles. In other instances, um, as Danny explained earlier, people have hesitated to report symptoms for fear of the awful conditions they'll be placed in if they test positive for COVID. Um, this type of cruelty is the blueprint for how DOC is handling COVID, and it's not going away anytime soon. While the court did not find in the petitioner's favor, we must continue to work to raise awareness about what's happening in prisons. It's necessary work, it's a human rights issue, uh, it's a racial and social justice issue, and it should constantly be in the news. Uh, we will continue to monitor what's going on in the prisons and think through and consider all potential next steps. But we also recognize that um, one tactic uh, alone is not going to solve this problem. Justice in the courts has not yet happened, and in some ways this highlights the limitations of the law. However, the law itself was never going to fully solve this problem no one tactic by itself will. Instead, use of multiple tactics is necessary to continue to bring to light the injustices within the prison system, including ongoing community pressure. The incredible work being done by family members and other activists and organizers, um, many of whom are on this call, is just one example of other efforts to bring awareness to the plight of people in prison and DOC's mishandling of the COVID crisis. At the end of our program, we will revisit the advocacy work around the Reynolds Six. Uh, justice for the Reynolds Six required many weeks of collective action by family, community, uh, elected officials, and legal advocates, and the willingness of the media to report this story. These six men were unjustly punished and quickly retaliated against by DOC with little to no due process because the department did not want to be held accountable for creating safer conditions in one of their facilities following a COVID outbreak. One of the men is here today to tell his story. The crisis inside DOC facilities remains relevant and important. As a broader community, we must acknowledge that the poor treatment of incarcerated people is a stain on our state that shows we cannot guarantee the health and safety of all our residents, something that all civilized societies require. As such, additional reductions of the population continue to be necessary, which take into account the vulnerability of individuals rather than whether their offense has been labeled as violent or nonviolent, a factor that's highly racialized and is not solely determinative of whether someone can be safely returned back to the community. Conditions in the prison also require substantial improvement. People should not be forced to use the restroom in bottles or soil themselves because the department chooses to employ inhumane means for dealing with the pandemic that humiliates people in prison and strips them of their dignity. Um, the pandemic is an opportunity and an important one to reflect on the fact that prisons have always been in, in, in inhumane places. Uh, however, the pandemic didn't create horrible conditions in prisons. It didn't create the use of violence and retaliation against people in the prison. 
It didn't create poor medical care and lack of access to appropriate treatment. Instead, it merely amplified those problems. These are the effects of mass incarceration generally, and those problems are going to continue to exist long after a vaccine is made available and long after it's declared that COVID is no longer a global threat. That's why it's so important for the media to recognize the opportunity this moment presents with the convergence of the COVID pandemic and the ongoing fight for racial and social justice. We need journalists to report on these issues and for electeds to continue to work with communities and their constituents to address the harms of mass incarceration. But we also need to listen to families advocating for their loved ones. A part of this work is holding VOC accountable for the violence, the retaliation, and poor medical care it provides to the people it is entrusted to protect. We have to continue to demand that policymakers and the governor support and adopt policies that significantly reduce the number of people in prison and reduce the number of people serving long sentences. And we need to do this while also demanding accountability and transparency of VOC. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick, for reminding us of the power of community and the importance of collective action and protecting and standing up for and with our incarcerated loved ones. The Department of Corrections has a brutal pattern of medical neglect and inadequate, inadequate care for our loved ones who are incarcerated. And as we can see, the prisons are ill-equipped to handle the COVID-19 pandemic. These systems are sick. And we know that the Department of Corrections is irresponsible when it comes to medical care inside in times that are not a pandemic. We know that the outbreaks are inevitable with overcrowding. And we know that racial disproportionality in COVID infections is very high, which further exasperates, uh, is further exacerbated in DOC facilities. We know that incarcerated black adults are approximately 1.5 times more likely to have COVID infections than black adults in the Washington state general population, like within this population of our state. A little later, we will hear more about the stories that echo the horrors that Harold Donald faced. We are asking the Department of Corrections to stop using solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is torture, and we are asking them to stop using it to address COVID. We are demanding care and compassion for incarcerated loved ones. Solitary confinement is inhumane and without question should not be used. The answer is reducing overcrowded prison populations and reallocating prison budgets uh, to this solution is what we want to see. As Nick mentioned, a lot of work is going to fall into the hands of families, community organizers, and activists. It's gotten so dire that folks have done hunger strikes because of the inhumane use of solitary confinement. We're going to hear from a recent law graduate who is calling attention to the grave conditions in Washington and Oregon Department of Corrections. Rose, can you introduce yourself and share why you felt you needed to go on a hunger strike, along with the demands from people inside? Also, can you let us know how journalists and community members can advocate for change in the prisons as a result of the pandemic? Hey, um, hi everyone, my name is Rose. Um, like Nikita said, I'm a, a recent law school graduate. I'm here in Seattle. Um, I wanted to acknowledge um, the ancestors of this land, um, the people of this land, the Duwamish Coast Salish people. I wanna give thanks to, for being a guest on this land and to acknowledge um, not just as in words, but in practice, this system has never worked for indigenous peoples, for black, pe black folks, for other people of color, that the system has always harmed and abused us without accountability. So that is the groundwork that came before going on hunger strike. Um, how that started in this crisis, loved ones are already terrified for the folks we have on inside. My brother is incarcerated in Monroe, which is a prison that has had an outbreak. Another loved one is incarcerated in Eastern Oregon Correctional Institute, which is also experiencing an outbreak right now. Um, that on the same day that the Oregon prison had um, confirmed their first case, he was taken to solitary confinement. So I wasn't able to speak to him um, until after a month. 
because they limit communication that intensely. Um, a number of us participated in a protest outside, pressing for the release of a sufficient amount of people to provide for safer conditions. As people have articulated, prisons are never safe. Prisons are never a place where you can get adequate medical care, but we wanted to press for safer conditions. Um, the Department of Corrections in Oregon has acknowledged that social distancing is necessary. As uh, several folks have articulated, that's a well-known fact. The Department of Corrections in both Oregon and Washington know that they are unable to provide those um, necessary conditions. Um, after protesting in front of the Eastern Oregon Correctional Institute, we heard that someone had died in that prison. Um, a woman whose fiance was held there initiated a hunger strike and I joined her out of fear for my loved one's lives and also to show support for her, show, show support for loved ones on the inside to let them know that we will take whatever action is needed to fight for them um, and to demonstrate to my loved ones how serious the situation is. Because a lot of people don't get that this is essentially a death sentence for a lot of people, um, a lot of our loved ones on the inside. So I wanted to make sure people understood how serious the situation is. I also wanted to demonstrate that there are so many different ways to take action that no matter what you do, as long as you are building with those around you and fighting for your loved ones inside, then your action is so necessary. Whether it's calling into the governor or whether it's having a protest um, in front of the governor's house or in front of the Department of Corrections, whether it's writing letters to prisoners, no matter what you're doing, that is an important aspect of fighting for our loved ones on the inside. I wanted to make sure people were aware of, of a hunger strike that started a couple of days ago from that same, that same loved one that I was striking initially for. Um, you can find in the comments the, the page to get to the demands, but I wanted to tie what's happening in Oregon in with what's happening up here. It is the same fight. The Department of Corrections is doing the same thing. They're not providing adequate medical care, as is the case up here in Washington. I know from experience with my brother, when he had seizures, they were not providing care. And we as family members have to fight for that care. We have to fight for them not to kill our loved ones. The same is true down in Oregon. Um, in one of their demands, that there are men on hunger strike, starving themselves, demanding that they transfer a man named Stephen Corbett to a hospital to get adequate medical care. We are always the ones who are having to fight for our lives and the lives of our, our loved ones. We cannot trust these institutions to do it. And as people have articulated, the lack of transparency leads to abuse from these COs, as is the case with Harold being abused and then criminalized for, for nothing, really. Um, that the fact that the, there is a lack of transparency, a lack of our ability to ensure that they are safe, um, requires us to put more and more pressure on them to continue to call them out, continue to um, fight for accountability. Uh, I also wanted to um, articulate that the last demand in the Oregon hunger strike is they're just asking for one call a week, um, just one call a week to be able to communicate with their loved ones because we are the ones who are going to keep them safe. Similarly, here in Washington, we've seen restrictions in, on communications. We see the Department of Correction abusing its power, sending people to solitary, um, and restricting, restricting their ability to communicate. So I just wanted, I want to end just by saying that these, these fights are integrally connected, that we are stronger when we fight together, and that no matter who you are, your contribution is necessary and valuable. So I don't want you to think that whatever, whatever you do isn't going to make a difference. Because once we come together, that's the only way that we're going to be able to address this issue. And finally, I just want to say, when we, as we are framing this, we need to make sure that when we are holding DOC accountable, we're not just saying, oh, they're not giving our, our loved ones adequate care. 
that we're calling it what it is, which is murder. Two people have died in Oregon. I believe I could be wrong on how many people have now died in Washington, but there are at least two people who have died and they knew it was going to happen. It was articulated back in April. It is the natural and probable consequences of their action and their lack of action. They need to be held accountable for that. We need to call it what it is, and that's murder. So please join me in the fight to, to stop the violence from the Department of Corrections. Um, for reporters, please write these stories, spread this information, and for everyone else, do whatever you think is best in this fight. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, thank you for grounding us and remembering the importance of really speaking truthfully and honestly to what is happening and using exact language when we talk about the harm and atrocities that are happening to our loved ones. In our last press conference, we were very focused and committed on uh, freeing the Reynolds Six, a clear case of retaliation by the Department of Corrections. The outcome of this situation shows, most importantly, that strong and organized community action can address wrongdoings within the Department of Corrections. But we also want to highlight that this fight is not over. The Reynolds Six concerns were legitimate and unfortunately not an isolated incident. They are emblematic of how the Department of Corrections operates generally, how it treats all of our loved ones incarcerated in DOC. The Office of Corrections, OMSBUD, was concerned enough by the, the concerns that were brought to them by the Reynolds Six, their families and community organizers to initiate a full investigation of these retaliations. It took ongoing community pressure to get this level of accountability after bogus claims and the battle is not over. This is a part of a long-term community effort to bring awareness about how DOC operates against black, brown and poor people. But we are initially, we are intentionally ending on a high note while also asking reporters to begin investigating how the Department of Corrections is causing harm, how, as Rose put it, is, is essentially giving our, our loved ones a death sentence and, and committing murder and its negative impacts on our loved ones inside and their families and their communities. Part of the question is seeing how systemic racism creates harsh reprisals when black and brown and native people rightfully ask for accountability around inhumane treatment. Levon, thank you so much for being here with us today. And we're so excited that you're able to join this fight on the other side of the wall. What was your experience when you were retaliated against and return to prison? And also, can you give us insight on the perspective on the hardships our loved ones inside are dealing with uh, when it comes to COVID day to day, including solitary confinement and family support? Yes, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I love to start with uh, to Chandra and to Dean and to, the, to everybody who has family members going through the hardships right now in DLC. Uh, we're praying for you. Um, so I'd like to give you guys a little bit of background of what happened to the Reynolds Six. So on May 1st, there was a protest outside of the one of the DLC institutions in downtown Seattle called Reynolds. It's a work release building. And um, my family, a part of many other families, were outside protesting their concerns about COVID because of the outbreak within the building. And um, that day, six of us were gaffled up for no reason. We were uh, shackled up. I served eight years and I had about 26 days till I was supposed to go home. And solely because of my sisters and my family and my loved ones was outside protesting, which they have every right to do, we were all punished and took to IMU, which is the whole, for, and we're stuck in the cell for 23 hours a day in harsh conditions. And um, it's ridiculous what they're doing. And, the thing about it is the fact there's an intimidation factor going on within DLC about this COVID right now. When I was in that building at the Reynolds, the staff were threatening all of the inmates to the point where we're scared to say 
we're not feeling well, which we should have every right to. It's inhumane to say that. And they're telling, they're telling the inmates across DLC, if you get sick, you're going to the hole. If you get sick, you're getting kicked out of work release. So now you're putting me in a situation where I'm scared to say anything. My, I myself was sick and I was scared to say I was sick because of just not wanting to go back to prison, just like everybody else. So that in itself is causing big harm because if it's 10 of us in a room and three of us aren't feeling well and, and there's an elder around us that we may pass it to, it's not fair because we should be able to tell them we're sick and give us the medical, medical attention we need. But if we're too scared to tell them that we may be putting the people that are at higher risk of death from COVID at harm's way. And um, I would just like to say, explain how the IMU in itself is, 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 is very inhumane and it's, it's an unjust thing. And for DLC to put inmates who are having mental health crisis, who are having, who are testing positive for COVID, there's, there's, there should be no way that I'm being punished for being sick. Or there, there should be no way that anybody should get in trouble for, for having their family speak out. So it's just, we, we need to shine a light on, on, on what's going on. And the fact that the fact that what they're doing right now to these families is, is just, is horrible. And I just like to say that when community comes together and uh, people are really power. So this fight, this same group here helped us just the Reynolds six, just a few months ago. And if it wasn't for this group of people, I would still be incarcerated in the hall somewhere. And just, we just all need to come together. Everybody needs to play their part in this role and just please, let's just keep fighting and, when we come together, a lot of things can shake up. And what DOC is doing is unjust. And all across the state right now, even before I left the uh, uh, WCC, which is the, the transitioning center in Shelton, Washington, there's three inmates to a cell in every room. There's no way of social distancing. This is a two-man cell. You're having a person sleeping by the toilet. You have three grown men in one small room, six by eight cell, which is incredible. And, and we just need to shine a light on it. And like I said, people are power. So everybody, please, just, just keep fighting to, to, to Chandra and to Dean and to everybody whose families are going through these hardships. We will fight for you guys. Thank you guys for having me. Levon, it's so great to see your face and to hear your voice. Thank you for being here with us today. Yes, uh, for sharing your story and your experiences. Uh, Council Member Zahalai, uh, we just want to acknowledge you for standing with families and uh, for being a part of this dynamic work. And in particular, we want to acknowledge the win that community organizing in partnership with you was able to bring about in this last two days, both at the Seattle city level and at the King County Council level with the Mead Chance Dunlap Gittins uh, Youth Right to Council Ordinance. Thank you so much for continuing to stand with communities and for standing with the Reynolds Six, showing up literally the day of the moment Liban was removed from, um, from Reynolds. You have been an early advocate with, with the six families. Can you share more on what constituents can do to ask their legislative officials, their elected officials to speak up and stand on the right side of history? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nikita, and thank you for your incredible work as well. I learned a lot from my experience working to help release the Reynolds Six. Namely, I learned the gravity of the problem, and I learned what the most likely solutions could be. The gravity of the problem I learned on a day back in May, I received a call telling me that there's an emergency at Reynolds Work Release Facility in Pioneer Square, and I was asked to come support incarcerated family members as soon as possible. I rushed over to the facility and the images I saw there that day will stay with me forever. I saw Liban, the wonderful young man that you just heard from. He was shackled, gagged, and loaded into the back of a van. A young man who had already served 99% of his eight year sentence and was weeks away from being reunited with his family. He was being sent back to state prison. Again, he was being sent back to state prison during the middle of a global pandemic after already having served his term. My head swiveled to look back at Liban's sisters who were also standing outside of the facility that day. The terror and the tears in their eyes are things that I'm never gonna forget. 
they knew like I did that this move by DOC during a pandemic could mean a death sentence for their brother whose release was imminent. He was weeks away from being released. In the time since that day, I've learned that this is not a situation specific to just Liban. This has happened to several others and is a systemic problem, as you have heard throughout this call. The second thing I learned from my Reynolds 6 experience is that the most likely solution is advocacy. I say advocacy because our formal systems for bringing about resolution are ineffective. As you have already heard and as you will hear throughout this call from attorneys and family members, our formal sy systems for transparency, accountability, checks and balances, they just do not work. I would advise constituents to lean into advocacy, support the coalitions working on these issues, and make the world and your elected officials aware of what's going on. Today, look up who your state elected officials are. Tell them the stories that you heard on this call and ask them what they will do to protect our family members in prison. When we did this in Lib Liban's case and the broader Reynolds 6, great state level allies like Saldana, Wynn, and Johnson, and uh, they, they were able to work with us, with numerous community and legal advocates to bring a resolution. But reactionary help is not enough. We need legislation to prevent things like this from happening in the first place. Please continue to create the pressure to make this happen. And we will see the world that we all want to see. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Zahalai, for your continued accountable partnership with families and community organizers. Shade Smith, you are have been a dynamic attorney here in Seattle King County, representing the interest of accused peoples and fighting for Black community in a very brilliant and dynamic way. Can you close us out with the trends you see as an attorney? supporting clients during COVID and your experiences firsthand with supporting the Reynolds 6 uh, effort. Yes, um, thank you. I appreciate everybody for having me and um, to be able to speak on this very, very concerning issue. And as other people stated, the abuses by DOC did not start with COVID and they will continue unless we address a system of, with abolition. Uh, as of August 11th, there were 95,000 398 people in prison that had tested positive for COVID. And that was a 10% increase from the week before. This is a threat to community in custody. And as Nick stated previously, this was all predictable. And I believe Rose said it as well. People have known the entire time that our incarcerated members of community, the people who have been caged, were at the greatest risk. And we have to think about the comorbidities of the health disparities that exist within the prison system and that have always existed. In the situation with the Reynolds Six, we can see that labeling somebody as a criminal creates a lack of humanity and dehumanizes people. And it makes society a little bit more comfortable with enslaving them. And we know that um, incarceration is a continuation of chattel slavery. It's clearly in the 13th Amendment, but we can see it with all the evidence of how the carceral system works. Just some facts about um, the prison industry. It's a $182 billion a year industry. The impact, or it impacts wealth accumulation. The, natural, the national average for caging someone a year as far as the price is 31 to 60,000 a year. Washington State only spends 11,000 on students a year. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. So we are talking about something that is um, a global health crisis, um, incarceration anywhere. But as far as the impacts of mass incarceration in the United States, it has been way more impactful and way more destructive to communities than COVID even has. What we see with the Reynolds 6 situation is DOC's huge power disparity and their ability to control the narrative, to retaliate against people. Laban's family was bold enough to exert their First Amendment rights. And in doing so, DOC responded with um, retaliation and violence. The idea that a state-funded institution would retaliate against community for exerting First Amendment rights is, is extremely concerning but it's also a complete threat to the idea of democracy. We cannot have people being shut down and silenced because the state wants to uh, prevent people from being aware of what's happening behind bars. And even the state's continued control of the ability for community in custody to communicate with their family is disturbing. Rose listed one of the 
requested just one phone call a week. Could you imagine? Like, what else is going on inside of DOC custody if people can't get their stories out and they use the label of criminal to continue to dehumanize and justify their restrictions and they make billions of dollars a year off of um, slave labor? In the case of the Reynolds Six, the infraction, the infraction process was used and manipulated to, of course, against our clients. In the case of Roger Green, um, he stood up and made a statement in support of the Reynolds Six. By the afternoon of the next day, he was double infracted and back to Shelton at the end of May. So even his support, not having actually been involved with the protests whatsoever, not having family out there, meant that he was going to be retaliated against. And as Levon touched on, he was sent back to Shelton and he was caged inside of a two-person cell, although there shouldn't be any people in cells, but a two-person cell and there's three people. He had his head by a toilet and his feet under um, the bed of another individual. And there is a document, there's documentation of those infractions and yet DOC did nothing. It wasn't until um, community organized and made requests for information that there was some type of movement from the ombudsman. But at the end of the day, we still can't get access to video. That's the video that would dispute DOC's um, commentary and lies and those allegations. And that again points out how much of a power disparity that is and how much of a threat to so many community. If we have so many people, especially BIPOC, who are incarcerated and there's no access or transparency, as people have already stated, this is a complete threat to people's health and safety. We see the system consistently making a lot of rules, right? How many laws do we see on the books every day? But those laws are always manipulated and used to harm community as opposed to support community. The system weaponizes bureaucracy and weaponizes it against the safety of our people. It's important if we wanna move forward to one, recognize that the state has an obligation to people that they're forcefully um, keeping in custody. Those people do not want to be there. And so if you're gonna take custody of somebody, you have obligations uh, under the eighth and 14th amendment. You cannot harm people. You cannot subject them to cruel and unusual punishment, but the lack of humanity and even acknowledging that you have custody. If you cannot meet those needs, then you must release people. The state equivocating on release, the governor equivocating on release and the courts equivocating on release is wrong. It is, there's no hesitation. There should not be any lengthy need for motions um, or any work by attorneys whatsoever. They know exactly what's gonna happen. They were told in April, they were told in March, they were told before they are killing people if they do not release people. And they are, that blood is on their hands and they need to take this responsibility for that. Thank you As far so as much. steps moving forward. Oh. Sorry, Shade. Um, no, I'm gonna allow you to wrap up with your last steps and then we need to transition to uh, let Cassandra know she's on deck. Oh, actually, I think everybody already said it. I will stop. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Shade Smith, a local attorney in the Seattle King County area. Uh, here is our wrap up call to action from a very long time activist, Cassandra Butler. Cassandra has a brother who is serving a long term sentence in the Department of Corrections. Cassandra, can you share the list of demands from people inside? We also ask that the journalists help us pay attention to the Department of Corrections responses to our press conference, including or especially retaliation or lack of response. Thank you for all of your work, Cassandra, and for being here with us today. Thank you, Nikita. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cassandra Butler, and I'm speaking today as a, as a loved one of incarcerated individuals. The stories you have heard today are the worst fears of all of us that have loved ones inside of these institutions. These stories are the reason we are here, to demand the equitable and humane treatment of people that we love. Before I read our four demands, I just wanna remind you all again of a few reasons why it is so important that we see these changes now. Coyote Ridge at one point had over 200 positive cases of COVID inside just this one institution two incarcerated individuals that were only a short time from release died due to the conditions inside being a petri dish for COVID-19. Individuals have been placed inside solitary confinement as a way to quarantine them. Human beings are using the bathroom and coffee cans being fed slop for food, all the while being cut off from communication with family members. The Department of Corrections has said repeatedly that they have stopped chain buses from moving incarcerated individuals from institutions where there is positive cases to other institutions, yet we hear from our loved ones that this is not the case. Shelton, a receiving prison for Washington State, has people still sitting and receiving. In fact, they are stacking human beings on top of each other. People are sleeping on the floor next to toilets with no word on when they will be moved. I recently spoke with a friend of mine who has two sons that are incarcerated, one at Coyote Ridge and one at Shelton. 
During this pandemic, she's been given little to no access to speak to and check on the well-being of her sons. Frustrated, she reaches out to DOC staff only to be dismissed and hung up on because staff feels she is over-emotional and upset when in reality, what she is really feeling is the same sense of panic that we all are. You have heard today many reasons why it is so important that family members are able to have eyes on their loved ones inside. Without contact, Department of Corrections has proven over and over again that they will operate any way they want because they are not accountable to anyone but themselves. They have proven time and time again that they have no regard for our loved ones inside and in fact don't view them as or treat them like humans. This is why Free Them All in community with the BPC in Stafford Creek have the following demands. We demand decarceration in Washington institutions by 50%. We demand the defunding of DOC by at least $300 million. We demand the improvement of the quality of life for the currently incarcerated individuals. And we demand care, not cages, supporting community reentry and reducing post-release surveillance. I wanna thank you all so much for giving me the time to speak. And I want to remind you all that are listening that our incarcerated loved ones deserve to live with dignity and safety. We need to stop racism and intentional spread of COVID-19 inside DOC facilities. We are again asking journalists to help us pay attention to the DOC responses to these press conferences, including the retaliation and or lack of acknowledgement or response. Here you will see a slide with information for contact with Governor Inslee um, and to DOC Secretary Stephen Sinclair. Please contact them and demand that our voices are heard. If you'd like to join us in our fight, the next slide you will see is our listserv and the social media pages in which you can stay connected. Lastly, I just want to let you all know in the chat, um, you will see a post for an action this Saturday that marks the National Day of Freedom and Justice rallying against mass incarceration and against the prison industrial complex and modern day slavery. Community, please join us for a rally on Saturday, August 22nd from three to five at Clallam Bay Correction Center a rally where we will again say we are tired of inhumane and unjust systems that disproportionately impact BIPOC communities and continue to cage and kill our loved ones with intention. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra, for bringing those demands to us. And also, once again, thank you so much for all of your advocacy and your work. You have been steadfast and committed and we're deeply thankful for your time with us today. We want to close with a meditation on a life lost. Victor Bueno was our first COVID martyr in Washington state. And you'll see a slide with some artistry. He was slated to come home and he died needlessly. He was murdered in the Department of Corrections due to their lack of urgency with reducing prison populations and taking the COVID-19 pandemic seriously. Victor's life being lost was entirely avoidable. We don't want any more deaths, any more loss of life in Washington prisons. The lives of our loved ones are precious and they should be treated with dignity and with honor. And so just to remind you all, if you would like to ask questions, this will be now our time for Q&A. Please go ahead and send those questions directly to me. My name is Nikita Oliver in the chat. All right. Is Danny still on the call with us? Danny Waxwing? Yep. Danny, I, I'm going to direct this question to you first and then may have others uh, speak. Steve Kiggins asked if we could tie in the discussion that we've had today, the stories that have been told uh, with a uh, public health lens. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll just say, like, I think that it's really important to see 
DOC and our, and our incarceration facilities as uh, part of our community and absolutely part of when we're talking about public health, like the conditions within DOC have never been compatible with public health. And, um, you know, I think that there's been some commentary that exists out there about, you know, you have staff who are going in and out of the facilities, bringing it in, bringing it back out. But it's really important to understand that we're just all connected and we can't forget about this part of our community when we're talking about taking, uh, you know, action in the name of public health and responding to COVID. I don't know if there's a more specific question there, but also let other people respond to that if they want to. Would any of our other speakers like to speak on how uh, addressing the issues of prison conditions is a part of what is a public health lens look in that regard? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next question. And um, Sade specifically, I, I would like to ask you if you wouldn't mind stepping in and answering this or at least a part of it. Uh, Steve is also asking if there is a connection between our fight when it comes to the prisons and what is happening there and the current demonstrations that are happening in the streets. And you have been working very closely supporting um, a lot of incarcerated loved ones as well as supporting protesters. Do you mind just drawing a little bit of a picture around how those things are actually very interrelated? Yes, sir. let me get a second to formulate what I'm going to say. Um, the conversation is generally that like any liberation everywhere is collective. So when we're talking about starting or challenging the carceral system, whether people are protesting the streets against police brutality, that ends up resulting in or continuing to people's imprisonment later. Um, what we're talking about is liberation generally. Um, what we're seeing in the streets is that, again, like similar to the situation with the Reynolds Six, anytime somebody is protesting or exercising their First Amendment rights, they're met with um, state sanctioned brutality. And that is leading to um, further harm. People are being drug in and um, currently with the protest cases, people are being arrested. The prosecutors for the city and the state are not going forward whatsoever, but they're held in custody. And their ability to advocate and their ability to be free is being impacted because they are choosing to exercise their First Amendment rights. So the state is using their power to terrorize people. And until we can actually name that and acknowledge that that's exactly what's happening, we can't really address it. We need to hold the state accountable for their actions and their lack of actions around police and government brutality, especially within the prison systems. Um, what's happening in the streets is literally a continuation, but most people are hitting the streets and they're acknowledging that they are advocating for prisoners inside as well as people have been released but are still impacted by the mental health trauma. And the fact that solitary confinement is used is, is just bizarre to me. Um, there was the conversation even in King County about not using solitary confinement for juveniles anymore, but it has been for decades recognized around the world as a torture method. So the fact that we're having a conversation in 2020, but even a conversation in Martin Luther King County about whether or not we should be using uh, solitary confinement on children, people in general, is just showing how behind the times the state is and reflecting on how they should treat people. So if we are going to move forward recognizing that all of this is a continuation of this greater state harm, the harm which is this huge power disparity, um, it would help in collecting or connecting um, the fights for liberation, but also recognizing that it doesn't just stop with people on the streets and also people in custody. Thank you so much, Sade. And to also just tie in, you know, state sanctioned violence, whether it is uh, on the parts of police, uh, whether it's on the parts of courts, or it is within the criminal punishment system as it relates to jails or prisons or immigration detention centers, is all a part of an entire system. And so the defund movement in the streets currently as it relates to police is really just one part of a much larger movement. We've seen the known youth jail movement in King County push back very clearly against the building of a new youth jail because we know that jails are inherently uh, violent, they're disruptive to communities and they prevent having strong, healthy communities which promote public health and public safety for everyone. And we, we see this also with uh, the fight against the Northwest Detention Center and deportation. So there is a very inherent 
Uh, there is an interconnected fight that is happening in the streets, knowing that police are really just one aspect of the larger uh, system of state sanctioned violence that Black, Indigenous, communities of color, queer and trans folks, poor communities are faced with on a daily basis. Uh, Nick, I'm going to direct a question to you and, and maybe a few of the other legal advocates that are representing legal orgs. Uh, it was asked, are the four demands above also those of the legal organizations represented here? And Nick, part of the reason I'm directing it to you is because you spoke during the press conference about what some of the next legal steps might be uh, from in that, in that realm of things. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for um, other legal organizations. I can speak for uh, Columbia Legal Services that these ideas are absolutely ideas that we support. Um, it was included in the um, request for relief in the Colvin case, which was to um, decarcerate uh, the Department of Corrections as a means to um, protect people in those facilities. Um, but that more generally applies um, uh, outside of any pandemic is there's, there's, uh, there's too many people in the prisons and they should be um, back in their communities um, where they're able to live um, healthy and uh, productive lives. Um, and that naturally correlates to a, a reduction in funding for the Department of Corrections um, and also a, a redistribution of resources back into the community um, to those uh, organizations and um, uh, 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 services that can uh, best uh, support people's reintegration back into the community. And like mentioned earlier, allow them to um, live uh, uh, productive and successful lives um, free of uh, incarceration. So, so yes. Do any of the other legal orgs want to address the question as to whether or not the four demands represent what your orgs are uh, representing moving forward? All right. I did see a question about the Department of Health. Uh, my understanding is the Department of Health is the main authority but uh, where we would stand is that the county board should advocate because this is a public health risk for the people that live in those communities as well to answer the question that was sent to everyone uh, and just a reminder if you do have a question please send it directly to me my name in the chat is nikita oliver and i uh, just want to ask very specifically if anyone has a question for dean or shandra who were who are the you know the representatives the family members harold uh who is uh, currently dealing with with a lot that Chandra shared earlier and Dean's wife Cynthia um, so if you have questions for them please send them to me in uh, the chat Dean I do have one specific uh, question for you uh, as you were speaking about your fears uh, regarding uh, her condition and uh, the ways in which COVID would impact her is she showing any symptoms that would have you concerned that she might have COVID yeah, she she has uh, recently contracted a fever, and um, they're monitoring it because uh, they don't know if it's due to her extensive medical conditions or or what. Uh, they they're not they're not testing people in there, so there's no way to really know. So yeah, we. If my wife catches this virus, she has no immune system. She suffers from lupus, an autoimmune disorder uh, that attacks the body, and there's no cure for it for that. If she contracts the virus with their ongoing uh, internal organ failure, um, she will not survive. There's just no way. Thank you, Dean. I was just asked, uh, Dean and Sandra, do you all have any specific demands of what you want to happen right now? Um, I'll let Sandra go first. Thanks, Dean. Um, first and foremost, I just want my brothers to be taken out of IMU and I want his mental health to be addressed. Um, I also want him to see an eye specialist so that he can get his eye taken care of. 
and hopefully there's a chance that he can regain his sight in his left eye once again. I also want the three officers involved in the attack to be held accountable in some way, whether that be criminal charges pressed against them for the assault, whether that be they lose their jobs at the very least. I just think DOC needs to have some accountability for bad behavior. Those prisoners that are behind bars are there for their bad behavior, but the officers have so little regard for human life and treat inmates like they're less than human and there's no consequences. Um, am, I, am I on? I can hear you. Okay. Something has to be done. There's, there's no way that the Department of Corrections or for any reason can ignore what's happening. We, we also have to understand that the threat is not only to the offenders, but it's to, to staff inside the, the facility. It's, it's, it's a, it can affect the, the, the medical staff there. We understand that there are issues. There's lack of medical treatment. There's lack of proper uh, treatment from the guards. But you have to understand that everybody is infected. We're in this together. And the state cannot just ignore it. Um, the state Supreme Court ordered, ordered the governor and Mr. Sinclair to protect the safety of, of the offenders. That hasn't happened. And based off the numbers that are showing, um, it's only gotten worse. So they can't take a blind eye to this. It, something has to be done. I don't know what the answer is to that, but you know, if, if we all come together, I'm sure we can find a solution. Uh, offenders that are medically disabled, near death, or could die, should not be in the facility. They should be, they should be um, at home. They should be able to go to doctors and get get treated for their issues, you know, that they have. Um, the less people that are incarcerated, the safer the environment for everybody, not just the offenders, but for everybody. You know, um, and we as people, we have to we have to join together on this. We have to come up with a solution that's going to work. And and ignoring it and kicking a can farther down the road is not the answer. So that's all I got to say. Thank you so much to both of you, Dean and Chandra, for being here with us, sharing your stories, for your advocacy, not just for your loved ones, but for so many. Uh, Chris Carney, I believe you are uh, here with us and you are uh, working with Harold. Can we ask you a question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, what are the formal options that Harold has moving forward to receive proper health care or ideally, you know, one of our demands is decarceration. What are the options for Harold? Well, for decarceration, that's going to have to be something that's handled by DOC and the governor. They're going to have to take responsibility to take care of the inmates in the Department of Corrections. And for accountability for what happened to him, his option and what I'm investigating for him is a possible, possible civil rights lawsuit. Uh, I think that it is incumbent upon the Department of Corrections to understand why their officers thought it was reasonable or necessary if they were addressing the question of him wearing a mask to pull him out of his cell after he was already safely back in the cell. I don't understand why there was any legally valid reason to use force to remove him from the cell without a mask when the issue was wearing a mask. And so one of our immediate objectives is to call upon the Department of Corrections to explain why force was used in this case at all and why it is necessary for him to be for almost two months in solitary confinement when everyone knows that that will only make his mental health condition worse and to a degree that amounts to torture. So as far as his immediate options, I'm gathering information that will help me pursue a possible civil rights lawsuit on both those issues. Advocacy from the community is the best bet for decarceration for everyone, including Harold. 
Thank you so much for being here with us today, Christopher. Of course. Uh, and we are thankful for the advocacy that you are providing for Harold. Uh, that'll be our last question, but I do want to bring us back to a very important point of this press conference, which is our demands. First, we demand decarceration now, and that's the reducing of the prison population by at least 50% through clemency, commutations, and legislative changes. The second demand is to defund the Department of Corrections by at least $300 million. The third is improve the quality of life of our incarcerated loved ones, especially medical access. And lastly, we demand care not cages. We reject the ongoing surveillance through our electronic home monitoring and we demand supportive community reentry, which ensures that our loved ones are welcomed back with open arms and able to live healthy, whole and thriving lives uh, with their families and the people who care about them and the people that they care about. So thank you so much for joining us here today, for hearing the stories of families fighting for justice, fighting for care and compassion, fighting for the things that we all deserve to have our human dignity honored. And we all deserve to live safe, healthy, whole lives. And with that, we will close out our press conference.